So we're on a sermon series that uh, we found from Ryan Houston called Go. And last week, Rick talked about the fact that there's that gap between our spiritual lives and our daily lives that we live. And he talked about bringing it together because there really shouldn't be separate lives. There should be the life that we live that's on commission with God and Jesus and we're following his will. And so today I'm gonna get into what resistance looks like, where it comes from, the fact that it is something that comes from within oftentimes, that it's self-generated, self-perpetuated, and how our worst enemy can be ourselves. And there's a couple of points in this sermon and so I'll give them numbers because I know you guys like to make your notes. The first one, is that the more important the call that we have that God is putting us on or the action that he's asking us to take, the greater the resistance we're going to come up against, whether it is outside or whether it is from within us. And it works against us and it it, it does it well. It's used to doing it. The greater the impact we're going to have with what we do, the greater the resistance we're going to have. We can use our our church and our outreach as an example. The more people that we had coming in, the more we started to do, the more people we touched, the more providers we had come into the building, the more resistance we were coming up against in the community and in the city about helping us get funds. There was always an excuse to not do it. The farther forward we went, the more resistance we came up against. And the greater our call, the easier we can sometimes find it personally within our lives for us to make up reasons to not do what's being asked of us. Because the resistance becomes so great that it overwhelms us. And I mean, I know I have had that happen, and I bet you everybody in the room has had it happen to one degree or another. Resistance is also, this is point number two, a universal thing. It happens to everyone, everywhere. Nobody is free of it. And God has put scriptures in the Bible that says that we're not alone in this, that he has made a way for everyone to be able to face it. The problem is, are we committed to removing the resistance that constantly comes up against us? That's the question that we all have to ask ourselves. Point number three is that resistance is always obstructing us when we're in the position to go higher. It never goes down. So in our forward momentum, doing better, doing more, doing different, changing our lives and the way we act, I want that job that's going to allow me to be able to worship God more and give God more time or glorify him through that position. That's when that resistance comes. It's never going to come when you go, I don't want to walk today. It's raining. Resistance is never going to stop you from not walking today because it's raining. Resistance is going to stop you from walking today because it's raining. I'm going to walk no matter what. I'm going to walk rain, snow, because I want to feel better, I want to be in shape, I want to be able to do more for God. So resistance loves to stop that higher plane of existence for us. The better we do, the more we get. Uh, We had somebody baptized, I think it was a couple years ago, that we went out of our way to say, when you do this, resistance is going to come. It doesn't make it go away. It doesn't necessarily make it easier. There's going to be more resistance that you're going to feel now. Be ready. Come to us. We're here to help you. And that's another thing. we got to do this together. Remember, we're walking in the purpose of God while we're on commission. And Satan hates that. He despises it. And so he loves to use every door that he can get in to stop us as that resistance. Oftentimes, and this is point number four, resistance is invisible. Can you really reach out and touch resistance unless it's a person in front of your face that's actually 
you know, mirroring that resistance at you. You can't reach out and touch it. It's always working. It never sleeps. And it is powerful. You cannot deny that resistance is powerful. You can't see, like I say, resistance because it's invisible oftentimes, but the one thing you can see is its result. How many things are left undone? How many things did you say you were going to do? And it's like Brian Houston said, those books. How many books are unwritten? How many people are unspoken to? How many businesses are unopened? You get to see the, the end result of what resistance is in your life. And that can be a very overwhelming and sad thing for some people, but you can overcome it. And in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, do I not see it? Are you, are you, are we, there we go. No temptation has seized you except that is common in man. And God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. What he's talking about, the up under part, is the load that we must bear. God loves to, and we've often said this, come in and even Pastor Bill has said it, to the cruddiest, worst moment in life, help you bear that load and prove his grace and mercy, grow your faith and empower you to be him. And it says, oh, Dad, did you go next already? You did. You went ahead of me. Resistance and temptation, again, are common, but God has given us a way to overcome all of it. And point number five is, if you live a small life in a small way, that is what resistance looks like. Now, let's, let's point this out. When you live small, you discourage others. You have time to sit and nitpick. And uh, I'll use Brian's example. It was kind of funny. His example that he used was, you see somebody walk in the door at church and you go over to your friends and you, did you see her when she came in? Did you see the way she was dressed? Oh, Lord, she needs Jesus. <laughs> if you've got time to do that, you are not on commission with God. When you live a big life, you are always an encourager. And big is equal to that of being on mission with God. If you have time to criticize, like I said, you're not on mission. And those who are on miss mission encourage others. They bring them along on the mission they're on. Who, who does that? We do that a lot here. We like to, as Dad Rick puts it, assimilate through including people. We bring them in, we love them, we take them along with us, we let them help, and they get used to that feeling of the relationship that God's calling them to participate in. People who are on mission with God are doers. They do not sit on their hands. They are not like the guy who got the one talent, who buries it in the ground and does absolutely nothing. They are using the talent, and I'm gonna use it in the other word form, not the money form that talks about in the, the scripture. They use the, the gifting, the special gift that God has given every last one of us, whatever that is, they use that to glorify God, they use it to go outward, and they multiply because in the commission, we are to go what? And make disciples who make disciples. And so they don't sit on it. And the biggest thing is that they speak success into the lives of others. Not only are they an encourager, but they speak success into the lives of others. How many times have you ever come up to somebody and had them be so discouraged and they said that I, I want to get this job. And we said, no, you don't need to worry about that because God's going to give it to you and you're going to be fruitful 
and you're gonna be able to multiply what you're able to do, and you're gonna be able to shine his light in the darkness of wherever you go. And that person's just like, man, I just don't know, because I've been trying for six years to get a job, and this economy is horrible, and they turn right around and bam, they get the job. And they come back and they say, thank you so much, because it's that believing for them when they're not able to believe for themselves, because that's what Jesus was all about, he knew and he would speak that success into other people's lives. All things are possible. All things are possible through Jesus, yes. Now, number six, this is a big one. And this is something that I think everybody has done at least once in their life. Resistance can look noble. And by that I mean, if you are a musician and you want to write worship songs or you are an author and you have that book in you or you're a group of people who want to help others so bad but you don't know how to do it, you think that as the musician, well, I'm gonna go take a, 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 a music class, I'm gonna go take guitar lessons, I'm gonna hone my skills even though you've been playing since you were like 15 and you're 45. I'm gonna hone my skills, I'm gonna make sure I have everything right before I do it. And I'm going to, I want to start this outreach. I want to start this outreach. I want to help people. And this is what the nobleness can look like sometimes. Instead of creating the program that will help the people, they have a meeting to create a meeting, to create another meeting that's all about creating the project. And then they deconstruct that last meeting that was about creating the project. And then they have a meeting to implement it all. How many times have we all gone through that in our workplace? The meeting with the meeting, about the meeting, and what was the original meeting about? I mean, it can get crazy. That noble look sometimes, and I know I've done it, can create you know, your fear of not being able to do it perfect will make you want to go and get more knowledge, and, and it's stopping you. It, you're, you're slowing the train down a little bit, and you're not in faith, just, God, I'm going to do it. Be, dis, despite my fear, God, I'm going to do it. Now we come to Colossians 2, 6 through 7, and I'm using the message version for a reason. It is powerful. My counsel for you is simple and straightforward. Just go ahead with what you've been given. You received Christ Jesus the Master. Now live Him. All of our sermons have been that God, Jesus, they reside in us. We are His hands and feet. This verse right here in this form, in the message form, says it. He's in us, capital H. We are Him when we talk to people. We are him when we shake people's hand or bump into them in the produce section or when we get on the bus or we talk to people at the bus stop when we're waiting. Wherever it is, we're in the line at the pharmacy counter. We are capital H him. Next slide. Got to hit the little arrow, daddy. There you go. You're deeply rooted in him. You are well constructed upon him. You know your way around the faith. Now do what you've been taught. School is out. Quit studying the subject and start living it. Just do it. Just do it. We're going to use the Nike swoosh. We're going to use, yes, that's, we're going to use the, the Nike swoosh mentality. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. I mean, you just, and it's, it's okay that we have fear. It's not okay from God's perspective because he wants us to have faith in him and trust in him and rest in him, but we're humans. And so we fight that human nature in us always. And at some point, we have to put the book down even though we think we need to read it for the seventh time because we might have missed something and just go out and do it. Get her done. Yes. There is never a right time to be on commission with God. If you wait, the time will never come. 
Something is always going to get in your way. Always. Resistance is always going to get in your way, whether it's a cold, a flat tire, whether it's the lost job. I recently found somebody, uh, a friend of a friend of mine, who had been struggling to find a job. She got a good job, had given her two weeks' notice. She had been at that job for about six months and was getting ready to move to working with Amazon in their new warehouse down in DuPont. And she went into work on the first day that they told her to come in, and she arrived there, and there was no job for her. She had no job. And she had quit the other one. Talk about resistance. She had done everything right. She has another job. She's still paying her bills. It's not the step up that she hoped it would be, but she's not going to give up. She's going to keep moving forward. So this difference that Rick was talking about last week in closing that gap, it's hard for us to want to close it because our fear gets in the way, but that difference is like Brian says, it's the life that we live every day and it's the unlived life within us. And now I'm going to ask for you to just think on why does resistance work so well against us? It is because the mission that we think we're supposed to be on does not often look like we think it should look. Well, and I will give an example of somebody's life. They wanted to be a minister, and this happens to be Brian Houston's story. He wanted to be a pastor. He'd gone to school for it, but instead he ended up working a part-time job and two nights a week scrubbing toilets and two nights a week stocking shelves at the grocery store, and on Sundays being a youth pastor at this tiny little church. That's what his mission was. And a lot of people, I know I've done it sometimes, I did not go to school to scrub toilets. Oh, but you did, because that's the mission that God called you to be on. Granted, you might not be able to use your degree right now, but then again, why can't your pristine toilets and, and bathroom be a testament to the pride you have in your work and the dedication you have? For instance, yesterday, James came and cleaned the, the front room window at my parents' house. When he was done, I sat in that chair and I just like, man, that window is so clean. It's like there's no glass there. This guy is so good. I need to like win the lottery and hire him to come and clean my windows. I did. I mean, you could not tell there was a piece of glass. I kept thinking the breeze was going to come through because it's so clean. Why does resistance work so well against us? Because we often want our mission to be larger than the world we live in. But mission ends up being the world you live in and not the globe that you wish you could save. And so that means that sometimes your mission is going to be in the pharmacy line. It's going to be waiting in line at the grocery store at the checkout stand on a Friday night with 10 people in front of you and 15 people behind because they've only got two lanes open because somebody called in sick. <laughs> That's what it's going to be like. An example that I gave is Brian Houston's story, but I can also give an example that has to do with the Corinthians. Uh, before Jesus died, they were expecting to have a huge sign of who the Messiah was. They were not expecting a humble Jew that died on a cross. They wanted earth-shattering, fireworks, the Super Bowl party, here's the Messiah, woohoo! That is not what they got. But that was the mission field that he was on. That was Jesus' mission. That was the way he did things. He did it peacefully, not secretively, but almost. He did it in an intimate way, very humble. Oftentimes, being on mission with God is not something grand. It's I can use this example, and I think you guys have heard it before. It's, 
I need you to make a pot of soup because there's these homeless people that live in this, this, this hotel, and we're going to go over there, and we're going to serve the soup. No, I don't want to do that. These people can just get up and get a job. No, you are going to make the, the pot of soup because this is what you're called to do. Fine, I'll make the pot of soup. And that person's life has been forever changed because they saw what that pot of soup started in them. They saw that there was a calling they had and a need that could be fulfilled. And I say thanks to Steve Shem for demanding a pot of soup because that's what started our lovely outreach. Sometimes mission, like I said, is scrubbing toilets and stocking shelves and being a youth pastor at a tiny little church on Sundays. Sometimes it's not standing on the stage and being a pastor of a mega church. But we are also often wrong about the notion of what mission is because mission costs us something. And a lot of people don't like it to cost anything. They want the feel good of being on mission. They don't want the I am willing to crawl through mud with you if that's what's needed. That type of mission that God might call us to be on. And mission is always sacrificial. Some people have asked, how in the world does your church, your little church that could, as I call us, run the outreach, and how in the world do they do that shelter during the winter when it's open? Sleepless nights, and a great sense of passion for the people that we serve. If there was not the passion, we would all get burnt out. But God repeatedly fills the batteries of everybody who's involved, repeatedly. And our faith in that has allowed us, as a church, to stay on mission. And every time we think, well, maybe, maybe the time is coming that we need to close our doors, the shelves are bare. Maybe this is God telling us that the time has come. Bam! The shelves are filled to overflowing. When we live life on mission, the cost actually is really nothing. When you're in that moment on mission with God, even if it's cost you eight hours of sleep, you might be tired, but the reward of doing God's work is overwhelming to the, the human senses. It doesn't matter that it cost you that gas you know, money. It doesn't matter that you were gonna go on vacation but instead you paid somebody's electric bill. It's worth every cent, every sleepless minute. It's worth every walking upstairs helping somebody move as Bill's son so lovingly loves to do. He loves to help people move. And when you live on mission, the cost is nothing. It is all worth the sacrifice because the deep fulfillment of knowing and feeling you are living on that mission and God's purpose, and as Curtis likes to say, that divine purpose, you just know. And one of the examples that was in the video was a woman who, she'd had a corporate job, if I recall correctly, and she finally realized that for years God had been calling her to do something different. And she walked away from that successful life and started to tend to people who were at home and elderly. And she had to take a pay cut. And she was so worried that that would prevent her from doing this. But God provided everything she needed. And she was able to continue to do that. And she was able to, to, to speak to people one-on-one. -on -one. And that is a huge thing, that peace, over, just, it just overflowed her and she knew she was doing the right thing. And oftentimes, people who are on mission can be un misunderstood. I can, I think we as the congregation in our outreach, we, are we were misunderstood for many years. They thought, they being other churches and officials, thought we were just coming in and we were only gonna be here for a little while. We didn't know what we were doing. There was no way it was gonna work. 
we were just going to facilitate people to continue to be bad or stay homeless or leech off society, whatever words they wanted to use. But that is not what we are about. And the success stories of people coming here and getting connected to services prove them wrong, even though they misunderstood us. Jesus was misunderstood his whole life. At 12 years old, he wanted to go be with the educated people and learn and, and talk and say, hey, I got to go be about my father's work. And he said that in Luke 2, 49. Jesus was criticized and judged the same way people who go on mission are. Why are you doing that? What, what, what's the payoff for you? People who ask those kind of questions, I pray for them. I pray for them. I don't, I don't judge them. I pray for them so that their understanding can be broadened and their eyes can be opened because they don't understand why. They don't understand the call that we all live by. People question our motives. And people try to drag us down and they tried to drag Jesus down. And in the end, he was crucified because he was so misunderstood. And the next, it's not necessarily a numbered point, but it's a, it's a key nugget of information, is that resistance is spiritual in nature. I'll put it that way. God, like the, the verse, like the songs have said, has prepared a way for us. He's given us a way out. Um, if I recall correctly, one of the videos was talking, that Brian was in was talking about how when the guy got released from prison, he found it easier to break the bonds of the prison and get through the gate than it was to get into the door on the other side of the meeting room of all the people that were praying for him to be released. Wasn't that one of the, yeah. It's, it's that kind of thing. God, God gives us a way out of things that are out of our control. Plagues, oppression, bondage. And he equips us, and that's the things that we're learning in the sermons, that's what we're learning in the Bible studies. With him, capital H, in us, we are equipped with everything we need to overcome whatever is in front of us. And we need to understand that, we need to embrace it, and we need to claim it, and we need to act and walk around like we've got the power, because we do. We're not weaklings. So now I ask you, hypothetically, you know, in your head, think about it. What is ruling you? What is the power that's over you, that drags you down? And what is keeping you in bondage and keeping you off of mission and being with God? Jesus is the overcomer and he sets you free. And in John 16, 33, it says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Even though we might be persecuted and even though we might be, you know, be misunderstood and we go to do what we know God has called us to do, but repeatedly things get in our way, but we do it anyway. Jesus has overcome all of it, and he did it to set us free. And in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. In the New King James Version, I like it also, it says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And to us being Americans, that's a big word. It's, it's, there's liberty. You're able to live the life that he has created you originally to live. It's that whole, how can you be so peaceful and calm and happy in the midst of the chaos your life is shoving in, at, your, at you and, and in your face and all of the stress? I do it because God's in me. I have capital H him. And in John 8, 33, so if I recall correctly, I started earlier. Did I add the earlier verses in there? No, I didn't. Contextually, 
Jesus, if I recall correctly, is speaking to the group of people that are around him and saying that this is what I'm doing, the son. He doesn't say that I'm doing it, but he says, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And above that, and I think it's two verses ahead, before it, it says, you know, and you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So when we, as Curtis loves to say, embrace that. And by embrace it, I mean it is a way of life and you don't think twice. It's your go-to solution. You never stop to think. It's there. So we are to live a life set free, not entangled by the bondage of our human nature. And I appreciate that Curtis is teaching us about that in Bible study because there is that difference. That's part of the gap. The human nature and the spirit of God that's in us. That's bringing those two to where it's the spirit of God in us. And in Mark 16, 17, did I put that up there, Dad? Yeah. There we go. He said to him, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. Now, the reason why I added the other verses was because I wanted to give you the context of what was being said. The will drive out demons. First of all, we are the ones who believe. We are the ones that have him living in us. And we are the ones that can drive out demons in his name. And the reason why I tell you that is because resistance itself is a fight against demonic oppression, that human nature, that sin that Satan originally committed of wanting to be bigger and better and badder and more awesome than God. That's where it all comes from. Our fight is to be on mission, and it isn't against flesh and blood things. It's against principalities and powers of darkness and the spirits that are in that darkness are not more powerful than capital H, he that lives in you. I often have people ask us as the outreach people, how in the world can you go to these people's camps? They fight you, they will come out of the bushes if they don't know who you are and they'll tackle you or they'll freak out. It's putting the armor on, and we know that's our job, and we just go. We just go. We, we don't have any fear. God has asked us to do it, and that's the, the road we go down. It's, it's amazing to me what I find frightening and what other people find frightening. They'll be going along with me, and they'll be afraid, and I'm, it's okay. God's got us. We're just going to go over here and talk to these people. So remember this, like the scripture said, where the spirit of the Lord is, which is mission, there's liberty, there's freedom, not just for you, but for the people that you are serving. And so now I challenge you in the rest of the weeks to come to go and be on commission with God. Thank you. <laughs>